Hey, it's Margie Bryce here, host of the Krabby Pastor podcast, and I am bringing to you the fine work of Reverend Dr. Matt Hook, pastor at Dexter United Methodist Church, and Dr. Martin Fletcher, a licensed psychologist and founder of the Renewed Hope Counseling Center uh, at a couple of locations here in Southeast Michigan. So in late 2019, Dr. Marty Fletcher and Dr. Matt Hook teamed up on a podcast and it's called The Shepherd and the Shrink. They said it was to respond to the growing mental health crisis, and we know about that, and to help people create healthy spiritual lives in order to restore meaning and purpose to individuals, families, and communities. Kind of a psychology meets spirituality, if you will. They just recently stopped producing uh, new episodes of their podcast, but they have left their work up and available on Apple Podcasts and several other podcast outlets. And actually, Dr. Hook and Dr. Fletcher will be helping me out with their podcast until mid-January as I take a bit of a break and come up for air and do some self-care myself so thank you guys this helps this helps me out a great deal and is much appreciated you can find out more about dr fletcher's practice at drmartinfletcher.com that's m-a-r-t-i-n and fletcher f-l-e-t-c-h-e-r.com anyway thank you to the shepherd and the shrink your story is about people, how you get along with people, what we do with what we've been given. And if you've ever wondered if you should help someone, even when you were afraid, even when you were thinking they were just lazy, this is what I want to talk about, what to do and what not to do to experience success. You can build the heart of a lion with a strong mind and spirit, because a lion's natural state is one of safety through courage, strength, and power. Hi, I'm the shepherd and pastor, Dr. Matt Hook. And I'm the shrink, Dr. Marty Fletcher. This is the show where theology meets psychology or mental health meets spirituality. Welcome to the Shepherd and the Shrink podcast. Before we start the show, I have something to share with you. If you or someone close to you is suffering from a sense of anxiety or loneliness, The truth is, anxiety disorders are the most common mental illness, affecting 40 million adults in the United States every year alone. And according to a recent study, more than 60% of Americans report feeling lonely, left out, poorly understood, and lacking companionship. This matters a lot, because loneliness is stressful enough to raise all-cause mortality by up to 30%. So, I've written a free guide with 10 ways you can start to overcome anxiety and defeat your loneliness. Don't wait on positive emotions. Learn how to create them for yourself starting right now. You can grab the guide by heading over to drmartinfletcher.com. That's doctor spelled D-R, martinfletcher.com. Hello, this is Matt Hook, one half of The Shepherd and the Shrink. I am the shepherd. And I get to talk to you today about what to do and what not to do in your life. You know, I get so tired of people who get taken advantage of. I get so tired of people who get into things like virtue signaling to try to get people to do things that they have no business messing with. A couple Thursdays ago, a woman who had joined our church had stopped by the office and she hadn't been to church in like six months. And it turned out she had been in Milan every weekend taking care of her elderly aunt and uncle for the last six months. Those of you in senior care know what that means. And she was telling me about this problem that she has. It seems that her cousins, who are the children of this elderly couple that she was giving her weekends to, told her You're abandoning the family. This is your mother's baby sister, and your mother took care of her. But I was so proud of this woman because she said, I can do other things, but I can't do weekends. You see, she was a realtor, and she didn't know how hard to push. And that's what I want to talk about tonight. How hard do you push? What do you say no to? What do you say yes to? And this woman was upset because of the conversation, even though I was proud of her. 
In other words, what can I say no to and still be a loving person? You know, I honestly believe people are doing the best they can. Most of the times when I think about my sermons that I'm preparing week in and week out, I trust that people are doing the best they can. What they need is some new information about God, new information about life, new information about themselves. And if I can catch people in an aha moment, I believe that's how God's spirit speaks to us today. So I want to see if sharing with you these ideas of what am I in charge of? What am I not in charge of? How can I say yes to good things? How can I say bad to no things? How can I be helpful for other people without losing my mind or my whole schedule? You know, most of the people that I know try to do a really good job. You try to do a good job with your marriage. You try to do a good job with your children. You try to do a good job with your job, with your relationships, with God. But for so many of us, it's obvious something isn't right. You know, I was thinking about this. How many of you guys remember the name of the book that came out in the 70s? I'm okay, you're okay. You know, I never read that book, but the title gets me because if everyone's okay, then who's causing all the problems? You know, for many of us, life just isn't working. And we're left with this deep spiritual pain. We are left with this deep emotional pain. And you know what? Life is about people. Your story that you tell. And I tell a lot of people's stories. I've done close to 200 funerals over the last 15, 20 years. It's just a natural thing. I tell people's story. Your story is going to be reduced to a few sentences. I try to expound on more than a few sentences if I'm ever doing your funeral. But think of it. Your whole high school career is summed up in three or four sentences. If you take longer than that, there's something weird about you. But your story is about people, how you get along with people, what we do with what we've been given. And if you've ever wondered if you should help someone, even when you were afraid, even when you were thinking they were just lazy, this is what I want to talk about, what to do and what not to do to experience success in your life, to experience what God wants you to in your life. Have you ever said yes when you should have said no? <laughs> have you ever tried to make your kids do anything? I've got four kids and it is more of a dance than it is laying down the law sometimes. But you got to lay down the law and clear boundaries. And that's what I want to talk about. How far do you push? How about your spouse? How about your friends? How about those of us who are manipulators? How about those of us who are yellers until we get our way? We yell. You know, I used to be really proud of the fact that I felt like I was known for getting my own way. And yet that's not always right. For many of us, trying harder isn't working. Let's face it. You're spending a lot of energy trying to live successfully. You're not lazy, but you've also realized, like I had to do, being nice out of fear isn't working. You know, many of us are people pleasers or lean that way. And a lot of us have realized our people pleasing efforts don't seem to bring us the intimacy that we need with love and with care and with friendships. Taking responsibility for other people isn't working. I would say most of us have difficulties in taking ownership of our lives. You know, this story of your life goes way back to Genesis. In the beginning, when God creates the world, the universe, before the universe is broken, and oh yes, it is broken, God told Adam and Eve, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air, over every living creature that moves on the ground. That's from Genesis chapter 1 in verse 28. And then we also find out that Adam and Eve, humanities, we are made in the image of God. Made in God's image doesn't mean that God has hair and eyes and a mouth and a nose necessarily. But being made in God's image means that we were created to take responsibility for certain tasks. Probably our first responsibility is knowing what is our job and what isn't, what to do and what not to do. And here's the deal. You can make errors in two ways. First of all, there's people who are workers who constantly take on duties that aren't theirs and they eventually burn out. You've seen people who will do anything for anyone, but there's always this catch, isn't there? Secondly, let's face it, whether you're an adult or you're a kid of any age, not taking on responsibility is what some of us have done to the point where it damages us. It damages our relationships. And for some of us, if we're pretty extreme in avoiding responsibility, we found out it gets you nowhere. 
though many of us tr keep trying anyway. Here's the deal. It takes wisdom to know what we should be doing and what we shouldn't be doing. Many people in their desire to do the right thing, in their desire to avoid conflict, to avoid pain, we end up taking on problems that God never intended for us to take on. There's some people here who've taken on way more than God ever wanted you to, whether it was your friend's chronic loneliness or your boss's irresponsibility or your sister's unending crises. Maybe it's taking on your church leader's guilt-ridden message that we need everybody to do a little more. Or maybe you've taken on your spouse's immaturity. You know, other people never quite get to the point of taking enough responsibility for themselves. And they're flaky. They never end up being everything God wants for them. They never end up experiencing everything that God has for them. And the rest of the world misses out on this because those of us who are believers don't ever seem to get there. And if we don't know what to do, and if we don't know what to avoid, we can't be good witnesses to the love of God in the world. You know, there is a phenomenal book that talks a lot about this that has really shaped my thinking called Boundaries. The Boundaries book by Cloud and Townsend is one of the top three books I've ever read for helping me sort out my life. They share some things, doctors Cloud and Townsend, who are psychologists also. Here's the deal, though. In this book, Boundaries, they're talking about when to say yes, when to say no, to take control of your life. And any confusion of when to say yes and when to say no, any confusion of this responsibility of this ownership in our lives is a problem of boundaries. You know, if you were to look on your satellite, on your screen, at your house, you would see a property line. Now, you may have a fence around that property line or it's invisible or there's stakes at the corners kind of a thing. But you can also see the other surrounding properties. Those lines on that satellite image exist, but you can't see them. And just like you as a homeowner set a physical property line around your land, you and I need to set a mental and a physical and emotional and spiritual boundary for our lives to help us distinguish what is our responsibility and what isn't. And when I am working in somebody else's boundary, that's not God's best for my life or for theirs. So for some of us, we have an inability to set boundaries at the right times with the right people, and it ends up being really destructive in our lives. You know, there's two other factors that make it really tough. The first factor that makes it hard is you throw in this call to be a servant that Jesus said, we are to wash one another's feet. Whoever does these things for the least of my brothers and sisters, it's like you're doing them for me. We are called to serve, to take up our cross. If somebody asks for your cloak, give them your shirt as well. If somebody asks for your shoes, you give them your shoes and they walk a mile. This seems really confusing. What does the Bible say regarding limits? You know, there's this another confusion in this as well that make it tough. And that is clinical symptoms like depression or anxiety orders or eating disorders or addictions, guilt or shame issues, relational struggles, find all their roots in boundary issues. So what does a spiritual or a mental or a relational boundary look like? Well, I want to share with you an example that came from that book, Boundaries by Cloud and Townsend. In the book Boundaries, the authors tell of a counseling session one of them was having where these two parents, a mom and a dad, probably in their 50s, they were parents of a 25-year-old man and they came to see this counselor. They wanted the counselor to fix their son who was 25 years old. So when the counselor said, well, where's your son? They answered, oh, he didn't want to come. Why? The counselor asked. Well, the dad said, he doesn't think he has a problem. The counselor said these words, maybe your son is right. I think that dumbfounded the parents. And when the parents said, tell me about your son, they talked about how he was in college and got kicked out because he slept in, because he was up partying, because he was smoking, because he was drinking, because he was gaming. He slept in, he missed classes, he flunked out, they kicked him out. So his mom and dad put him in another college and the same thing happened. They put him in a third college and the same thing happened. And after hearing the story, the counselor said, you know, I think your son is correct. He doesn't have a problem. I think the look on those parents' faces must have told quite a story. Yep, he doesn't have a problem. The counselor went on to say, you do. Your son can do pretty much whatever he wants, no problem. And you pay 
You fret, you worry, you plan, you exert energy to keep him going. He doesn't have a problem because you've taken it away from him. Those things should be his problem. But as it stands now, they're yours. Then the counselor asked this question. Would you like for me to help you help your son to have some problems? And the light began to go on. The solution to this problem would be to clarify some boundaries so that the son's actions cause him problems and not you. Your son doesn't study or plan or work, yet he has a nice place to live, plenty of money, and all the rights of a family member doing his part. Right now, he is irresponsible and happy, and you are responsible and unhappy. So this counselor began talking to the mom and the dad about how they needed some fences to keep their son's problems out of their yard and in his yard where they belong. The dad asked this question, which I think a lot of us ask when we think about not helping people in ways we probably shouldn't be helping. The dad said, isn't this a bit cruel to stop helping him like that? Isn't it cruel for you to stop doing things for some of maybe your family members, maybe your friends, maybe organizations? Well, in the case of the dad and the mom of the 25-year-old, when the dad asked, isn't this a bit cruel to stop helping him like that? The counselor said, has helping him helped? The Crabby Pastor podcast is sponsored by Rice Coaching. In this post-COVID-ish era, many ministry leaders are now leading different congregations in that the congregation they lead now is not the same congregation they had prior to COVID. Mostly, I'm concerned about the challenges facing today's ministry leaders. Having been a ministry leader for about 15 years, and I also worked in church revitalization process, I know I'm concerned about how well ministry leaders are able to follow the daring call of the Spirit into new ventures. And the first step for all leaders is to lead yourself well. So I help ministry leaders through the empowering process called coaching by deep listening and asking questions to help broaden their thinking, get leaders unstuck, and explore what God is calling them to be and to do. And it's an empowering process because the person being coached actually does the heavy lifting. This is a transitional time for ministry. New ways of being the church are being explored. To follow Jesus well, ministry leaders will need to do radical self-care so they can get off the hamster wheel, slow down, and hear God's callings. And that is my call and my hope for all of you as you listen to this podcast. You can find more information about Bryce Coaching at KrabbyPastor.com. In the physical world, we build fences. We have signs. We have walls. We have lawns that give this message. This is where my property begins. They say someone holds the deed to this property. And it's the same thing in the Christian worldview. In the spiritual world, boundaries are just as real, but they're often harder to see. These intangible but just as real boundaries are an ever-present reality given by God to increase your love, to save your life. These boundaries define your soul and they help you guard your soul and maintain it. Proverbs 4.23 is a famous proverb from Solomon. It says this, above all else, guard your heart, for it is the wellspring of life. In the Psalms, Psalm 121 says, I look to the mountains. From where does my help come? My help comes from God. And it goes on to say, he will guard your soul. God wants to guard your soul. Parents, are you protecting your kids' hearts or are you too tired and just say, oh, it's all right, it's all right, it's all right to everything? You know, I think we're so exhausted. It's so much easier just to say yes to our teenage kids or our younger kids than it is to say no and have to follow up with boundaries or discipline or unhappy kids. But when we say yes, everything's okay to our kids, we are creating little monsters who have no sense of boundaries and think they can control everything and everyone around them. We need to help our kids. We need to help ourselves to God's ideas that we call boundaries because boundaries define us. What is me? What is not me? Boundaries are where I end and someone else begins. Boundaries are what I am to own and care for. It gives me freedom when I realize I don't have to be in charge of everything. I don't have to be a slave to everybody else. 
It also gives me freedom to be able to do what I like within my own boundaries. We need to help our kids to this. Boundaries are where I end and someone else begins, what I am to own and what I am to care for. God designed the universe where we all live within ourselves. In other words, we inhabit our souls. We're responsible for the things that make up us. That's why this woman that came to see me, who was a realtor and needed to be free on the weekends, finally had to tell her family, I am putting up a boundary. I will help my aunt and uncle that I love dearly, but I can't do it every weekend for six months. We're responsible for these things that make up us. Some of us have some yard work to do if you want to think about it as yards. And if we're really honest, we've got some garbage in our yard that we don't want there anymore. So what I want to do is I want to play this out a little bit because boundaries show us what is us and what is not our property, what we're responsible for and what we're not responsible for. For example, we are not responsible for other people. Nowhere in the Bible, are we commanded to have other control, only self-control? But we spend a lot of energy trying to control other people. In the Bible, it talks about two and four, and this comes from the Boundaries book. We're responsible to others, and we're responsible for ourselves. Let me say that again. We are responsible to other people, and we're responsible for ourselves. In other words, I'm not responsible for other people, unless I've got some children at home that I have to be responsible for. But I'm responsible to my parents as an adult, but I'm not responsible for my parents unless they become incapacitated in some way. In the book of Galatians in the New Testament, it says, carry each other's burdens. And in this way, you'll fulfill the law of Christ. We're responsible to other people. Many times other people have burdens that are too big for them to bear alone. They don't have enough strength or resources. They don't have enough knowledge to carry the load and they need help. Denying ourselves to do for others what they can't do for themselves is showing the sacrificial love of Jesus. Helping somebody do what they can't do for themselves, that shows the sacrificial love of Jesus. And it's what Jesus Christ did for us. He did what we could not do for us. He saved us. He forgave us. He redeemed us. We're responsible to other people. But at the other side of things, Galatians 6, 5 says, each one should carry his or her own load. Wait a minute. Did you hear that? Galatians 6.2 says, carry each other's burdens. Galatians 6.5 says, let each one should carry his or her own load. In other words, you have responsibilities that only you can carry. By you giving them to somebody else, you're not taking care of the stuff in your yard. These things are your particular load that you need to take on daily, that you need to work out. No one can do certain things for us. We have to take ownership of certain aspects of life that are our load. Now, that sounds like the Bible's contradicting itself in this spot, but it's not. The word is burden and the word is load. And if we go back to the original Greek, the Greek word for burden is barrage, which means a heavy weight like a boulder. And these boulders can crush us. They can break our backs. We need help with boulders. When a time of crisis hits our life, when a boulder lands in our yard, that can crush us, a time of tragedy. Now, we are to bear one another's burdens. We are responsible to other people, but not for them. And that's where this other word, let each one carry his or her own load. The Greek word for load is portion, like the word portion, meaning cargo or daily toil. It's like a backpack. Everyday things we need to do that are possible to carry on our own. We're expected to do those things. Our feelings are within our backpack. Our ability to work, our ability to care for other people, our ability to relate to other people, our decisions, those are in our backpack. So everyday things that we need to do that are possible for us to do, we carry on our own. We're expected to deal with our feelings, with our attitudes, with our behaviors, as well as the responsibilities God has given each one of us. Even though it takes effort, some days it takes a lot of effort, but we're to carry our own load. But here's the problem. Some people act like their boulders, their huge boulders are like daily loads and they refuse help or as if their daily loads are boulders they shouldn't have to carry. Some people think life is just too tough for me. It's harder for me. And their backpack they think is too heavy for them to carry. And, and so there's true pain if somebody's trying to carry a boulder like it's a backpack or there's irresponsibility if somebody's carrying their backpack, but they feel like it's too much. Another thing that the Boundaries book talks about that comes from the Bible 
is the idea of boundaries and what to do and what not to do. Boundaries are to let the good stuff in to your life and they're to let the bad stuff out of your life and they're to keep the bad stuff out of your life. So you're supposed to let good stuff in and your boundaries are supposed to keep the good stuff in your life. Good relationships, good decisions, good ways of spending your time, good things in your schedule. But your boundaries are also supposed to keep the bad stuff out, to not let them in. And I tell you, stuff like the Internet. If you don't have boundaries with the Internet, you're going to be completely swamped. And there's bad stuff in your life. There's bad emotional scars. There's damaged emotions. There's wounds. And your boundaries are supposed to let the bad things out. It's not like a complete wall or a fence. There's gates in it. So boundaries help us keep good things in and bad things out. Jesus himself told people, don't give to dogs what is sacred and holy. Don't throw your pearls to pigs. If you do, they may trample them under their feet and then turn and tear you to pieces. In other words, we're supposed to keep the good things in. We're not supposed to throw it out for everybody to stomp on. You may have heard the old expression, pearls before swine. You know, our understanding this can keep the pearls inside of our yards, our lives, and keep the pigs outside of our souls. Sometimes we have bad on the inside and good stuff on the outside that we don't let in because we don't think we're worth it or something like that. That's Satan. That's not God's voice. Listen, if that's you, you need to be able to open up your boundaries to let good in and let the bad stuff out. You need some gates in your in your life that let good things in and that let bad things out. Interesting, Jesus in the gospel of John chapter 10, he says, I am the gate and the sheep know my voice and they come in through the gate. Anybody who tries to scale the wall is like a thief or a robber. And and he says, the thief comes only to kill and steal and destroy. But I have come that you may have life and have it abundantly. Jesus is that gate. For example, if I find I have some pain in my life, I need somebody to help let let it out. If I have sin within me, I need to open up. I need to communicate it with God and with other people. I need to ask forgiveness and seek repentance. I need to do a 180 on that and let that stuff out. Why would I want to hold on to that? I want to let that out through these boundaries, through the gates in, in the boundaries. And Jesus Christ said, I am the gate. Let me help you do that. He, so that I can be healed. Confessing our brokenness helps us to get it out so that it doesn't continue to poison me from the inside. Don't you know friends who have had a toxic relationship in their lives? Maybe it's with their parents. Maybe it's with their a boyfriend or a girlfriend. And it's just a toxic person and you wish they would break it off. You wish they would get it out of your life. Don't you know that's how God sees us Because God loves us infinitely, and he knows when we are clinging to something, maybe it's an old habit, that we need to get it out of our life and be done with it. And oftentimes we need a counselor to help us do that, or we need a small group to help hold us accountable. We need some Christian friends who are doing that mutually as we do life together. When the good is on the outside, we need to open up the gates and let it in. You know, let the sun shine, let the sun shine in. I'm dating myself from that song from the 70s or whatever. In scripture, Jesus literally says this, whoever receives me, I give the right to become children of God. Whoever receives me, in other words, we need, he is on the outside of our lives until we receive him. Talk about letting good into your life. That's Jesus. And there's a famous old picture of Jesus standing outside of a door and knocking. That's actually a quote from Revelation chapter three, verse 20. When Jesus says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with them and be with them. And and when Jesus says, whoever receives me, I will come into them and give them the right to become children of God. That's from John chapter one, verse 12. You know, other people have good things to give us too. We need to open up to them. But so often, because of our woundedness, because of our damage, we close off our boundaries to good things from other people. And we end up staying in a state of deprivation, where we stay in the state of emaciation, where we're just like starving ourselves. So boundaries are not walls. In other words, they help us determine what to do and what not to do in our lives, because we're letting good things in 
We're expunging bad things from our lives. And we're keeping bad things outside of our lives. And we're keeping the good stuff in our lives. The Bible doesn't say that we're to be walled off from other people. Actually, it's the opposite. We're to be one with them. We're to be in community with them. You know, when I'm giving this message right now, it is a time of COVID. It is so important that you are creating community, beginning to reach out to people, to good people that are good that you will let into your life. We're to be in community with good people like that. But in every community, all members have their own space and have their own property. You know, it's interesting. Oftentimes when people are abused, when they're growing up as younger children or, or youth, they reverse the function of boundaries and they keep the bad stuff in and they keep the good stuff out. One woman's name was Mary. When Mary was growing up, she suffered abuse from her father. She was not encouraged to develop good boundaries. She learned at a young age, what is mine is not really mine. You know, that's why victims of abuse or of whatever form, sexual or physical, they, our skin is like a basic boundary and it, it keeps the good stuff in. It lets the bad stuff out. And people who have, are, have been victims as children, they learned what was mine was not really mine. And, and it has messed them up. It has confused this idea. And that's how it was with this woman, Mary. Growing up, she suffered abuse from her dad. She was not encouraged to develop good boundaries. She would close herself off, holding the pain inside. She would not open up to express her hurt and to get it out of her soul. She wouldn't open up to let support from the outside in that could heal her. And not only that, she'd continually allow others to dump more pain into her soul. She needed fences that were strong enough to keep the bad stuff out and gates to let out the bad stuff already in and let in the good stuff. You know, we're talking about people. We're talking about what to do, our behaviors, our attitudes. And I think about the woman who stopped by, who had set a boundary, knowing people were going to start pushing against it, knowing your extended family, the other relatives of this aunt and uncle, including their own kids, her cousins, were going to push against her. And it is my prayer for that woman that she would hang on to the decision that she made. She will be there for them, she said. She loves them dearly. But for her to give every weekend to her aunt and uncle when there's other people around is a way to be responsible to them, but not for them. To let the good things in like a weekend that she needs for her business, for her life, and to keep the bad stuff out like complete exhaustion of having never one day to herself, never one day to take care of her own needs. This week, I want you to ask yourself, is this something God wants in my life? Is this something that God wants as a part of my property? Whatever that is, a relationship, a new hobby, an attitude, something on your schedule. Is it something God wants in my life? This is something God wants as a part of my property. Maybe it's an attitude or a responsibility or habit. And pretty much a lot of times God's going to say, yes, this is something I want for you. This is something I want in your life. Go for it. But if you're not so sure or you know in your heart of hearts that this isn't something God would really want for me, or this is something that will completely sidetrack me, then drop it. And here's what you need to remember. Some people won't understand, especially if you're somebody that's had messed up boundaries. People won't understand, but you know what? That's okay. I'd like to close in prayer. God, so many of us care for lots of folks around us. And yet sometimes, God, we need to learn when to say yes and when to say no, to take control of our lives, like that Boundaries book has in its subtitle. Lord, I thank you that you have made us owners of our lives owners in charge of things, but that you've also made us in your image. And God, you don't just force yourself on everything yourself. Lord, you have good boundaries. You let good things in and you keep bad things out. We need your help in this, God. And especially when it comes to family, when it comes to long time relationships, Lord, when it comes to the internet, there's stuff that you absolutely don't want in our lives because you love us that much. And there's stuff that you wish we would let go of. Lord, help us get the garbage off of our lawn. Help us get the, the harm and the pain out 
of our lives through the gate. And Jesus, I thank you that you said, I am the gate, that I am the good shepherd. Those are your words, Lord. And we claim those for us as we seek to know what to do and what not to do in our lives with our relationships, with our time, with our resources, our money. God, thank you that you have put us in charge of so much. And Lord, we need your wisdom to know when to say yes, when to say no. God, we ask that you would enable us to live in ways that reflect you. Pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for listening to the Shepherd and the Shrink podcast. You can check out the show notes from this episode, get free resources, discover more about our work, and all the ways to subscribe so you never miss an episode of the show. Head over to drmartinfletcher.com. Hey, thanks so much for listening in. As with any resource, I pray you find at least one nugget in each episode to challenge yourself and enrich your lives and ministries. And don't forget, if you neglect self-care, you run the risk of becoming a crabby pastor and a crabby person, whether you outwardly portray that or not. Maybe you keep it inside all to yourself. And we really don't want to inflict crabbiness into our families, on our friends, and certainly not on those whom God has given us spiritual leadership over. 